From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. By their very nature, primaries are often chock full of surprises, and 2014 didn't disappoint. Gina Raimondo won the Democratic nomination for governor, as some expected, but by a larger margin than many anticipated. Alan Fung also won big for the Republican nomination. Lesser-funded Nellie Gorbea snatched the Democratic nomination for Secretary of State from independently wealthy Guillaume de Ramel, and current Secretary of State Ralph Mollis defeated by Cumberland Mayor Dan McKee for the Democratic nomination for Lieutenant Governor. Democrats also picked Jorge Alorza to take on Buddy Cianci. And as it turns out, the least surprising result of all, Frank Caprio losing, and losing hard, to newcomer Seth Magaziner in the primary for general treasurer. This week on Newsmakers, the postmortem on primary day with our political roundtable. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the roundtable to talk about primary day, to my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi, and we brought in Dan McGowan, also of WPRI.com, to talk no about accounting the for taste. <laughs> 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 to my left, Eyewitness News political analyst uh, Joe Fleming and the executive director of Teachers Union, NEA Rhode Island, Bob Walsh. Everybody, welcome to the program. Thanks Thank for joining you. me. Thanks. Um, Bob, before we get into the analysis, I'm uh, going to throw a question at you. Uh, you and your organization were big supporters of Clay Pell. And I got to tell you, I'm sure you've heard it, there's a sentiment out there that Mr. Pell was a spoiler for Angel Tavares, dividing the union vote especially, thereby giving Gina Raimondo <coughs> excuse me, a path to victory. Is that what happened here? No. Uh, People forget, because I'm a progressive and a Democrat in the, my outside life, that I work for a labor union as my day job, and neither Gina nor Angel uh, met our standards uh, for endorsement, and Clay Pell did. He uh, had an extensive, active, impressive uh, understanding of the issues of educators in the state. Uh, he was not afraid to articulate them and stand behind them. It was the easiest Bob, decision we ever be, made. People will be shocked to hear that. People will say, I, I, right, look I, at what Gina Mundo did on the pensions. How could you right. give any comparison between your a potential problem oh, with Angel I, I, Tavares I, I, and a problem? I, I think at, at the surface level, the people who don't understand these issues in depth like uh, you all here do, uh, do say that, but they forget, or I can remind them, that uh, Angel did not have a great record on education. Fired the teachers, supported mayoral academies, uh, did not support binding arbitration, um, and we had some concerns about his campaign and his electability as well, which, you know, which bore out. And uh, campaigns run differently depending on who's in the race. The spoiler moniker is a hard one to give because it would have been a different race if it was just Clay and Gina, or just Angel and Gina. So, so Bob, I, let me I, reject, I reject the premise. We're proud of who we supported, <laughs> and we'll uh, regroup and analyze what, what we do going forward. Let me forward. ask you a couple of rapid-fire questions. Sure. On the <laughs> <short topic. laughs> if Clay were not in the race, would you rather have seen Angel Tavares win? No, not necessarily at all. That's probably the surprise. No, I, I personally, I, I could make an argument for either one. But do you um, think your members would have? No, uh, I think if they were retired members or close to retirement, they were probably angrier at Gina. I think if they were looking at a very long time in the classroom and some of the education policies Angel had, they were mad at Angel. All right, let me ask you a true or false, and then I'm going to ask it to everyone here. True or false, if Clay Pell weren't in the race, Angel Tavares would have been the Democratic nominee for governor? False. Gina would have won. False. Yeah, false. Probably false. Yeah. Okay, well, why is that, Joe? Well, I think, look at the vote she got. She got about 43% of the vote. You cannot say that all of Pell's vote would have went to Angel. I would say maybe two-thirds to one-third. And if that's the case, Gina still goes over 50%. It would have been a totally different campaign, but I still think in the end, Gina would have won. The other thing is, she did something which was increase the turnout. About 128,000 people voted with the absentee ballots in there. That's a good-sized turnout for a Democratic primary. It's more than the 2002 Democratic primary. So she was able to get more voters out. We don't know if there were a lot of independents. I'm assuming there are. And that definitely helped her more. So. She would have benefited either way. I think Clay had a real possibility of stopping Gina. I don't think Angel ever did. And I thought that from the beginning. The thing, the thing is, and it's... It, I hate so hold on. If Angel Tavares weren't in the uh, race, are you saying Clay Pell would have been the Democratic nominee? I think uh, so Angel there would have Tavares been a much a higher probability of Clay getting the folks who supported Gina. See, a lot of the folks who supported Angel had no reason not to support Clay. They just made a commitment early. 
Uh, those, you know, the, uh, Council 94, some of the other unions, some of the other progressive groups that, that, that sided with Angel, uh, uh, Clay would have done much better in Providence. Uh, he's a natural Spanish speaker. He uh, uh, resonates on those issues. He didn't hesitate to be supportive of issues. Uh, on the public sector labor issues that caused people to break away from Gina, they would have gone to, uh, I think you would have seen a much more competitive uh, Gina versus Clay race than a Gina versus Angel race. Ted. Uh, well, first of all, I disagree with Bob on that one. I think <laughs> a lot of public sector labor unions who weren't with Clay had uh, questions about his electability in the fall, but we can uh, debate that. But I think going back to Angel Tavares, I don't want to fall into, it's easy when someone loses to say everything about their campaign was bad and everything about the winning campaign was brilliant. That's not usually the case. But yeah. I do think you have to look at some of, if you look deeper into the returns, Angel Tavares, we just got the mail ballots this morning, we're taping on Friday, he lost Providence. Mm. A, pro a sitting popular, we still well, think Providence mayor should not lose Providence. And to my point, to be fair, if you take Providence out of the equation, Clay beat Angel net net in the other 39 cities and towns. It, so if you take as Providence you take, out no, no, but, 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 but as to electability, you know, you say, well, which one's more electable? But, I mean, but, we, you, can, you can rehash this and cut it and slice it and dice it. But. With Angel Tavares, is this the classic case of peaking way too early? I mean, he was ve he's been very popular for several years. He, uh, you know, last year we knew he was going to run for governor. He looked very good at the time. Is this an example of it just kind of crashed and burned towards um, the end? I don't think it's peaking early, Dan. I think it's mixing up favorability with electability. Uh, when Sheldon ba Whitehouse beat Link Chafee, he was at his highest favorability level he's ever had in his life. He, he Lincoln Chafee was. I mean, Link right. Chafee was. Yeah. But if, if you look at the um, polling data, Gina's favorability among Democrats is fairly, fairly low back in May and February. Come the August survey, her favorability jumped up to 60%. Mm. That definitely helped her. She was running even among Democrats in that three-way race in August. In May, she was running 10 points behind among Democrats. And this is another point people yes. miss because they're so focused on the pensions is that Gina Armando threw a, a lot of money in a, in a campaign, yes. built up her support so that she was on par you with... Know, it was, you know what's I fascinating mean. to me? Not just a lot of money. You wrote it, so a yeah, couple of great articles this week uh, <laughs> dissecting them, but... She outspent Martha Coakley. She spent double yes. what Martha Coakley in spent in Massachusetts. Yeah, in a, which is which covers three media markets. Is that what we're well, in for? It was a weird from here on. Well, out? She's no, out of money at the so. moment. No, I mean for <laughs> every four years. It was she's a gonna, weird yeah. hybrid too. Twenty years ago, when Murth York was on the ballot, and the, some of the public sector unions were with her. Not not all, but we were. Um, it, you couldn't get a lot of the other. This was an odd combination that Gina brought together. The generally considered more conservative building trade unions combined with a lot of, you know, the Kate Coyne McCoy progressives right. came and together a in a fusion that has never happened before. Well, look how she used some of the money. The early commercials with her father, with the uh, woman from Crossroads, she was aiming towards female voters when she was weak. She got those up there. The last commercial, Narragansett Beer, anyone over the age of 60, like me, Ted, uh, <laughs> relates to those types of commercials. And she was doing very well with the seniors. So she was going after groups she had to really move. And I think her media really did that. And, 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 Mark and, Putnam did an excellent job on her commercials. Ted Devine did an excellent job on Clay's commercials, too. But Putnam, <laughs> Putnam really hit exactly yes. with, uh, well, in, in what he needed to do. bolstering sort of her Democratic con credentials, right? Every time you guys attacked her for, you know, what she did oh, with Clay pensions. Clay never attacked. <laughs> Clay never well, attacked. Well, every time she was criticized <laughs> over pensions, uh, you know, she'd come back and she she had the women with her, like Joe right. said. She had older people with her. She she definitely, you know, really tried to beat that into people to, to yes. raise her. her She's she also, that. just to raise. just briefly on the money thing, yep. Tim, too, she, Gina Armando is a, it's it, her talent for fundraising is quite unique, oh. and it's yeah. not only something we don't usually see in Rhode Island. It's a rare thing nationally for someone who's who was still at her level, and it's clearly it's because of a her background for all the stuff. So she's a Wall Street Democrat. Well, frankly, yeah, Wall Street likes her, and so does part such as Silicon Valley, the Democratic money that backs people like Andrew Cuomo and uh, politicians like that, uh, uh, Cory Booker in New Jersey. Those folks are with Gina. Who was Armando. her husband's There's, roommate? Who in was college. her husband's roommate? <laughs> in college, right? There's a lot of money in those folks, but again, I don't think I don't think. Every Every Democratic frontrunner from now on is going to be no. spending yeah. $5 million. Right, I'm gonna, let me wrap up uh, this section with a question to Bob. Is the NEA, NEA going to endorse Gina Raimondo? Uh, too early to tell, but there are great, great concerns with Alan Fung. Alan Fung's a right to work, thinks everyone should be in a 401k. I, I, could, I could guess very strongly we're not going to be with Alan Fung. Some of our people are very angry at Gina and, and will Vent what, about that anger. Rest, what about the rest of the House of Labor? Do you see a lot of support coming out for Alan Fung I th uh, no. from Labor I, unions? I, 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 right I, he's work. right to work. Right to work is, is such a high hurdle and a high barrier <clears throat> to entry that um, I could not see it. I mean, we try not to cut off our nose despite our face. We may have been divided in the primary, but 
generally we try not to behave uh, foolishly in general well, Let's elections. talk about being divided in the uh -huh. primary. I mean, uh, if you think you guys had a bad night, Council 94 had an even worse night. All their, <laughs> uh, their major endorsed <coughs> candidates lost. Tavares, Mollis, Caprio, De Ramel. I mean, uh, has labor, lo Scott McKay wrote a very biting analysis <laughs> of primary day for Rhode Island NPR, and he said some of the biggest losers were uh, were unions. Well, uh, it's, is that know, power gone now? No, this is, this, is, this is a great thing. You're gonna call this spin. The fact that they're talking about how unique it is that we lost some races is marvelous. Why? People expect labor to win all the time. That doesn't always happen. And you know and what? We had people, on, you know, we, uh, we were with Seth Magaziner, for example, at NEA, and he, he, he won two to one. I think, you know, the story here is there was a labor progressive divide. But Usually Seth you wasn't with that. Council 94. No, no, they were, they were on, the, on the other side of that one as well. The, and the endorsed candidates did very poorly. Uh, none of the endorsed candidates on the statewide ticket won. And, and you know, if you look <laughs> down the ballot, <laughs> Almost every incumbent uh, General Assembly member won, and that's that's a win for Council 94. That's a win for the NEA in the, in the Democratic primaries. Oh you yeah, had, and we were 83 percent in our yeah. General Assembly you had Peter races. Martin lose over casinos um, in Newport um, as much and as and Lauren Carson is going to be a terrific state who representative. Beat him. Okay, and Dan <laughs> McKernan, and who Matty Yellow targeted. We're running, we we're running short on time for this <laughs> segment, so I, I want to stay with the governor's race. But uh, Bob Healy is now running as a moderate party candidate for governor. Joe, how does it impact the race and who does he hurt? Well, I'm not really sure who he's going to hurt, but I think he will draw some votes. I mean, Bob Healy is always good for five, somewhere between 5 and 9, 10% of the vote. I think he'll probably still draw that. People who are saying, I cannot vote for Alan Funk because the right to work. I can't vote for Gina because of what she did my pensions. There's now an option of somebody else to vote for. He'll pick up that vote, those people who could not vote for either one of them. The question is, on how much other things does Bob Healy do to increase his base of support? But I think it's, he, I'm not sure who he's going to hurt at this early date. I think we'll have to look a little bit farther in and see. But he will pick up votes of people who cannot vote for either Fung or Raimondo. Well, we should say there are two others right. on the ballot, too, Leon Kayarian and Kate Fletcher as independents. So there'll be, at the moment, there's expected to be five no. names on the governor ballot. Oh, and there's Alan Fung, the Republican nominee, <laughs> uh, mayor of Cranston, who did very well right. uh, in the city. Um, you know, and some people point out, oh, he won by <clears> a larger margin than even Gina Raimondo. But when you talk about the actual vote count, I mean, he did less than Ralph Mollis did in, in terms I of I got more of votes. votes coming in third for Congress than Alan Fung did winning the Republican well, now, primary. Now, of course, it's <laughs> not a fair comparison because <laughs> right. there's such a small turnout, but, but what, what is Alan, I mean, I, you I have to imagine true, Alan politified. Fung would rather have faced <laughs> any other Democrat than Gina Raimondo. Do you agree? Uh, possibly. I think she, you know, again, go back to the fundraising. People, I always say people hate hearing how much money matters, but it matters so much. And I think while her money is depleted at the moment, I think she can go back. She's getting all this positive national press <coughs> this week. I think that'll help her a lot. I do think, though, to Alan Fung's victory, a lot of people were writing him off in recent weeks because he had had a, a number of different missteps his campaign team had. And they had a strategy. Bring out <coughs> the vote in Cranston. He won Cranston 75-25. Even as Ken Block won, I think, a roughly one in three cities and towns across the state. Question is, was that heavy focus on right. Cranston, does that make him less competitive? Uh, does he get a, uh, is he behind a little in building there. a statewide he, he organization? No, oh, go ahead. Go he, ahead he's, of course, going to get a, a big boost, I think, nationally. Remember, uh, Ken McKay, who's all involved with the with Governor Kachiri for, for two terms, um, you know, is the political director for the RGA, for the Republican Governors Association. I think he will get a boost of national money. Ken McKay knows Rhode Island. He's going to have to fix that right to work yeah. comment, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So does Kate Coy McCoy, and, and there's no people's and there pledge. will be no. We're, we're at a commercial break, but I got to imagine no one's signing the people's pledge no, for the general election. No, yeah, 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 yeah. right, well, yeah. yeah, you're going to see a lot of independent It'll expenditures on both. Thank sides. you for reminding me. Yeah. Of the yeah. 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 All right, when we come back for uh, newsmakers, we have to dive into Providence. Uh, Buddy Cianci, Jorge Alorza, and Dan Harrop. That's why we have Dan um, McGowan here. So yeah. stick with us. You're watching newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This week, a political roundtable doing the postmortem on primary day. To my right, WPRI.com reporters Ted Nisi and Dan McGowan. We're joined by Joe Fleming, our political analyst, and from the NEA Rhode Island, uh, Bob Walsh. I wanted to bring Dan McGowan onto the program because he's the one to follow when it comes to all things Providence, especially the mayor's race. McGowan wrote an authoritative piece for Politico magazine this month, a monster and wonderfully written. Matter of fact, I'll put that on the uh, Newsmakers homepage so you can uh, uh, 
cl click to it. Keep you're clicking. welcome, Dan. <laughs> your, your page reads are going to go through the roof by <laughs> being on the newsmaker's homepage. But it was a great piece, Dan, and congratulations on getting Thank published you. in a national publication that says a lot. So let's tap into that expertise. Why did City Council President Michael Solomon lose? It's a great question, Tim. I think when you look at it, there's so much focus on the east side won it for Jorge Lorza, and no question about it, Jorge Lorza dominated the east side. But the big problem for Michael Solomon was his base didn't turn out for him, right? The, the fifth ward in, in Mount Pleasant and Elmhurst, that northern part of the city, uh, fifth ward, 14th ward, uh, fourth ward, didn't turn out for him in the ways I, I was expecting him to get a thousand votes in, in each of those wards um, and, and he wasn't able to pull it off in the way that he was uh, he was expected to and it just it couldn't make up for what happened on the east side it couldn't make up for that dominating effort another thing is uh, he lost Federal Hill right and that's a place where mm. uh, certainly it's a changing demographic over there but it was a place that I think he expected to do very well and he got beat pretty handily there so Dan Harrop is a Republican in the race Dan do you think he's getting pressure to drop out, to narrow the ballot from those who want to see Cianci defeated? Absolutely, and he, he's been getting pressure for months. Ever since uh, Buddy Cianci got in the race, he, he's been getting a lot of pressure uh, to get out. And I think the big thing now is, uh, you know, before he was this sort of anti-establishment guy. He didn't like Mike Solomon. Mike Solomon represented a lot of the things that he disagreed with. Jorge Lorza, he's a little more liberal than Michael Solomon, but he also has a very clean record. I think that that's going to put even more pressure on Dan Harrop to get out of the race. Let me add to the pressure. Dan Harrop, please drop out. <laughs> <laughs> and keep in mind, Tim, we saw in the primary what happens if somebody drops out of the race. Brett Smiley dropped out, changed the whole dynamics of the primary. Alorza would not have done well on the east side if Smiley was in that race. Yeah. Right. And Solomon probably would have won the primary easily. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Who, do you, who do you think would have uh, been, a lot of people think Jorge Alorza is tougher for Buddy Cianci than uh, Michael Solomon. Uh, anybody disagree with that I statement? think one of the reasons he's tougher, and I, I do defer to Dan on this stuff, is the fact that he's easier for everyone else to unite behind, yeah. right? A lot of people, uh, particularly from reading Dan's reporting and conversations I've had too, had concerns about Michael Solomon. Was Michael Solomon, uh, this, this ethics investigation, his own speaking style when Buddy's such a champion debater, there were concerns there. I think there's a lot more people who feel like Jorge Alorza, mm -hmm. all right, yeah, we can put him into the ring with Buddy Cianci. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Jorge Alorza on September 9th went from a good candidate with scant resources to a good candidate with a lot of resources and now I think there's no reason why a lot of Democrats aren't going to be very much pressured to get behind him even more than they were before and that's uh, and, and that's going to uh, say a Democrats, lot. Democrats, labor unions. Is, is, is CMC the incumbent right now? You know, a little bit, yeah, I think I think so. There's a lot, I mean, remember, there's a reason why everybody calls him the mayor, right? He, people people do kind of think of him um, at, as the sitting mayor in a lot of ways. The, the, the only issue with that is Jorge Lorza, make no mistake about it, starts this race as the favorite. But he is running from behind here. Well, also keep in mind, David Cicilline is still very popular in Providence. Absolutely. He proved that two years ago. He's obviously no fan of Buddy's, as Buddy's no fan of his. I expect Cicilline to get very active in this race and really get his machine cranking up to try to help the laws. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that, Joe, and I think that all the statewide Democrats have a real interest. Uh, and uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a stranger bedfellows race, perhaps, than progressives <laughs> and the trades coming together for Gina in the primary. This is everybody um, wanting to stop Buddy yeah, for I mean, a, a wide variety of reasons. There's it's, a reason why they call that the group on the east side that's trying to, you know, take out Buddy, yeah, anybody yeah, but yeah, Sansi's right, group, right? You know who else doesn't want right. Buddy Sansi to win? Gina Raimondo, if right. she's going to be the governor. And now, Alan Fung, I'm not, maybe he'd have trouble sharing the spotlight, but I think Buddy and Gina Raimondo are just oil, just not a good good combination. And she, the So what does she do? Are, I, think, I think her allies, I think she can work closely with Jorge in Providence. She needs good turnout in Providence, and so does he, obviously, in that. And she can hurt the people helping her, Kate Coyne McCoy, and that super PAC can also train some fire on well, this is this is a time for the Chamber of Commerce to finally put its money where its mouth is. I mean, they were very acquiescent to Buddy through his, you know, from 1990 to 2002, and never stood up. And maybe they were afraid, or, or whatever their excuses were. There's money there, there's the independent expenditure route, the businesses in Providence, and the businesses in the state who think this would be a blemish on the state should, should actually put put their funds into this effort and if they really the other, believe this Here's is the other opportunity that Jorge Alorza has with, with Gina Raimondo. Gina Raimondo did very well in Providence, right? She right. won Providence. Now she needs to run up the score in Providence. Right. And the big thing is now they both need to go to the south side where Jorge Alorza lost, by the way. Wow. And now they need to go, you know, make amends and, I and win I think some there. of that was related to Angel. Angel oh, picked absolutely. a lot of fights on the, uh, on the south side. Sure, that was absolutely. one of the concerns about his electability yeah, in his absolutely. own backyard. And that's the one place Solomon actually had a strong ground game. Yep. On the south side. So where? Bob, you uh, obviously 
clearly it sounds like you don't want to see CNC in office, but yeah, we should I think remind it would everyone. Hurt the state. Yeah, the NEA is not the teachers' union. We don't, union we in don't province. represent the teachers' union. That's in the Providence. AFT in province. So, where do you expect the unions to fall on this one? We have the firefighters, we have police, we have teachers. What's happening? Um, happen a lot of uh, uh, those groups don't actually have a heck of a lot of members that live in the city. The real unions you want to look at for the grind game in Providence are, are Unite Here, right. the hotel and restaurant workers, the service employees, okay. uh, the nurses, the folks who represent uh, uh, the support staff in the hospitals, the folks who actually live near where they work in those union jobs, those are the ones who actually can move votes in the city and that's going to be determinative. On top of that, I think that um, I, I think that you'll see a consensus at the leadership level at least in, in, in the labor movement that this would be a problem. This would, you know, this would hurt our ability to, to get things done. As, mu as, as good as Buddy might have been to unions in the past, and I don't disregard that, he was, you know, he was someone that the, there was uh, some success uh, in their negotiations and whatnot. I think this is a bigger question now, and, uh, and I would be, uh, there may be some individual groups that, that support him for their own reasons, and there's some stuff on education that, you know, you have to have a long talk with Jorge about, but yeah, I, I, there should be a big coalition, and Dan should drop out. <laughs> uh, Dan, Dan uh, let's wrap up the province conversation. You want to add to that? Yeah, way? sure. So, I mean, one of the key things to know, and, and Bob is exactly right, the, those major labor unions in, in Providence, uh, firefighters, police, teachers, the city employees, many of them don't live in Providence, but there is a reason they stayed out of the, of the uh, Democratic primary. They are waiting for Buddy. Um, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to endorse him, but I think it is certainly in play, and, um, and there's going to be a lot of pressure from I think from both sides. From, so from the silence could be deafening I, from I the think, unions. I think it certainly was in the Democratic primary, for sure. That would be a plus for Buddy. Absolutely. If those yeah. people stay out of the race, that's a plus for Buddy. All but right. again, never underestimate Buddy CNC and his vote ability. Uh, fair enough. Never underestimate yeah. Buddy. No. If he got in, he sees a path to victory. Right. <laughs> so uh, let's go back, take just overall look at, at primary day. You know, primaries can be funny things, and as I said in the open, uh, they often have a lot of surprises, and I don't think 2014 disappointed in that arena. <laughs> around, around the table, what was the biggest surprise for you from primary night? Nellie Corbea defeating mm -hmm. Gail Jeremel. I did not think she could pull that off. And why do you think she won? I, I'm still puzzling that out, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I yeah. love stumping Ted. Yeah, I know. I mean, with Joe Fleming and I were sitting there in the studio. We called every race, and we're going back and forth with 90% of the vote and saying, is, it, is, is she, she's still winning? When is she going to start losing like she's supposed to? I mean, does Rico, she had a very, she has a very smart campaign manager, Enrico Voda, who worked, beat the band, used every resource he had very smartly, had a good candidate, and then Guillaume Daramel so frequently came across as a little bit disengaged from his own campaign. But what, what was the undecided in, the, in our okay, poll? It was huge. 57% of the voters were undecided on that race. I really believe a lot of people went into the polls not even knowing on that race. And they looked down the ballot and, oh, well, Nelly, I saw that commercial. It was kind of different on TV. Maybe I'll give her a vote. I think the, the numbers show that on Election Day. The, the, that was a bigger undervote than the treasurer's yes. race. 14,000 people who voted in the governor's race uh, did not vote in, in the secretary of state race. And I think, you know, had Guillaume... Uh, put another hundred grand on TV or direct mail or something, maybe it would have been even. Plus, I think Nelly benefited from uh, the combined effect of folks uh, turning out uh, for Gina, it's about time to get a woman elected, and folks turning out for Angel, it's about time to have a Latino well elected right. statewide and Jorge in Providence. And the state has a history of female Secretary of States. Yeah, that's a Bob very Leonard, true. Kevin Connell, Connell, yeah, Susan yeah. Farmer. Yeah. Was there? Uh, was that your biggest surprise? No, you know, I mean that certainly was. I think the biggest surprise of the day. I think I have a question for Bob. The Dan McKee victory in the lieutenant governor's race. Um, it wasn't necessarily surprising that day, but if you would have told me a month ago that Dan McKee was going um, in that race, I, I would have been very surprised. We were always uh, waiting for the big independent expenditure yeah. to drop. Um, you know, Mike Trainer is a smart guy going over to that campaign. He's not going to be frivolous with his time. He must have uh, had that same assumption going on. And in a race where nobody was spending a lot of money, Frank Ferry, who we supported, got in very late right. and didn't raise as much or put in as much as I, I would have expected. Um, and, Ralph Miles and, never had And Ralph money. never had a lot of money. Right. And, and Ralph, you know, got caught up in a couple of uh, issues that, that made headlines. And so was we never, asked, Bob, uh, we asked yeah. you this before, but would unions, you think, take a look at Kathy, or at least teachers' unions, considering how vocal McKee has been on charter schools, would you take a look at Kathy Taylor, the, the Republican? Republican? I think she's a very impressive candidate. I think that um, she, if she was elected, she would continue in the vein of Elizabeth Roberts and focus on health care. Um, That's I not think a no. That <laughs> she's a John Chafee Republican. 
in, in the good sense. She's knowledgeable about environment, about health care, about small business. Uh, I think she's got a very impressive background. Well, impressive you, you, you just she's created never a had tweet. A, I can tell you that right now. She never had a grievance when she was uh, keep going. director of elderly <laughs> affairs. I met her through. Actually, uh, don't no, keep stop. going. We, we have, we have, a, we have a one minute left. And I'll tell you, very my, impressive. my biggest surprise from the night was uh, David Cicilline, his primary opponent, Matthew Fecto, got almost 40% of the vote against David Cicilline. And this was a really no, a no name, all due respect, uh, to the opponent there. If you're David Cicilline, you've got to be a little bit worried about that. 30 seconds. Any thoughts on that? I don't know if he's worried about losing, but I think no, he's but probably still, disconnected. disappointed. Sure. Yeah, I, I would think that he was a little surprised at how close it was. I think he thought it would be like 70-30. But again, there's a certain number of voters who are Democrats you're never going to get. Patrick Kennedy had the same thing. David's number seems to be a little bit higher, which means someone might think about challenging him in the primary. But again, David did nothing in this primary either. Yeah. So he did not get a and the, the longer the longer Quickly. the congressman you know uh, stays in office, the more difficult it is. Next in two years, we'll have a presidential. Right. It's going to be very difficult. To I see a whack a whole thing developing where people always think he's vulnerable, and then he always wins, and there's frustration on the Republican side and in the primaries. He so. could. He certainly had the ability to spend money if he thought there was any danger right. at all. All and right. Ted Nisi, Dan McGowan. Bob Walsh, Joe Fleming, thank you very much for joining us on Roundtable. If you've missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. That's also your place for campaign 2014. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.